I really hope I can find some more positive things in Act 3. I'm gonna be digging for them, just you wait. Well, turns out that was actually pretty easy. Right, hello! It's time for part 3 of me complaining about everything and anything in the Soto story. Or is it? Because for once I actually have a lot of positive things to say. Yeah, turns out when you give me stuff that's actually good, I can talk about that, not just the negatives. If you don't know what's going on here, there's two other parts in this series, but fair warning, I consider the first one to be a bit of a mess. Anyway, still a spoiler warning for literally everything, moving on. If video 1 was me complaining about a whole bunch of world building details, and video 2 was me picking apart the pacing of the story, where it doesn't work, and why, then this part is going to be me giving credit where it's due, and that's mostly in the character writing. Because Act 3 comes out of the gate swinging with what I consider to be the single best written scene in all of Soto, and that's confronting Zoja about Maban's death. Everything in this scene just works, and the characterization here is so perfectly layered, I absolutely love it. I could really go through this line by line and pick apart how every single one of them perfectly reflects some detail around the character's fears, insecurities, beliefs, and or their flaws. And the linchpin here is, Zosha is making this all about her. Yeah, that sounds stupid for the moment, but it's such a perfect execution that is giving us the internal conflict of a very flawed character. Zosha is a smart person. She's an Asura after all. But from her introduction in the book, all the way to her departure in Heart of Thorns, she's always been flawed. She's quick to judge, she's sassy, and she's, importantly, very self-centered. Those are her primary flaws, and since Edge of Destiny is essentially a classical tragedy, those flaws do not resolve by the end of the book in any way. The core story only touches on her in parts, after which she mostly isn't around. Everything in her life has only served to reinforce her sense of pride, particularly her standing in the colleges at Ratasum. It's only once she goes through a near-death experience that she actually encounters a catalyst for true change. And later, she joins the Wizard's Court, where she meets people that actually get her to believe that there is something more for her to be, something else for her to change into. Because up until then, her pride had her believing that any change would essentially be a downgrade. And so it's only now that we see her mask of snark and confidence slip, when she's not just grieving her friend, but also reliving the trauma of losing her former mentor, Snap. Most likely, on the one hand, she's thinking about the vision of growth Mabon showed her, on the other hand, she's thinking about the memory of the dead. And being a smart character, she recognizes she's acting selfish. However, being a flawed one, she sees her selfishness in the wrong way. Knowing what we know of the other characters, literally no one is faulting her for not jumping at the chance to undergo the ritual to become a full wizard and likely they wouldn't think her selfish for declining, but she is absolutely being selfish for thinking only about herself and her future, not about how the loss of Mabon affects anyone or anything else. And that is so good. It is perfect characterization for a flawed character. And there's so many other parts in this exchange that just makes so much sense for her character clinging to her academic achievement as a sign of personal value, not being able to seek help during depression, even though she kind of wanted it, hoping for her past life, in this case the commander, to support her, even though she knows that doesn't work in the long run. I can't say enough how well this works, and the commander is excellently done here as well, initially jumping on the chance to declare their support no matter what, but at the same time showing some cracks, wondering first about how they are seen in the eyes of others before anything else. I used to be so mad at everyone. You have no idea. At me? At There's only so much you can do with an audience self-insert, semi-blank slate character, but this is as much as you need to do. Though personally, I'd love it if we could expand this into a more involved conflict. A uh, non-insignificant amount of people are not as invested into Zoja's character arc as I am, 
it just happens to really fit the bill of things I care about. And I think a major weakness of it is, she's really the only one in debate here. Everyone else is purely supportive one way or the other, which ends up making her look like a dramatic teenager. So if we could add a little more pushback, reasons for her not to go through with the ritual in particular, that could add some much needed tension to the storyline. If I had to pick up the writing from here, I would add a scene in the upcoming story in which the commander is dragged into a vision by an enemy in which they go through a world where no one knows them anymore. Neither their achievements nor their friendships mean anything anymore. Everyone just kind of acts like they forgot about them. This would then prompt them to struggle more with the idea of supporting Zoja's path towards becoming a wizard, and having them act as a perfect foil to Zoja's internal conflict. Zoja, as a character, ultimately most likely wants to go through with this thing, but is afraid of forgetting the memories of those closest to her, particularly those that she's lost, feeling that she's betraying them by forgetting them. So she hesitates. And in this made-up continuation of the story, the commander would want to support her acting selflessly as they want to do, but ultimately they would rather keep her as she is, being afraid of being forgotten, essentially losing another one of their friends along their long road. Forgetting and being forgotten, two sides of the same coin. Look, if a scene can get me to think this deeply about a character's development, it's a good scene. And it really is ones like these that give me the high standards that I have. Uh, which is slightly awkward because the rest of Chapter 8 doesn't have a whole lot going on. Plot-wise, besides our first actual introduction to it, Garen, in the form of a somewhat contrived flashback, there's not a lot happening here. Seriously, what was the artifact's deal? The whole second half is just a bit awkward. Harmlessly, but it feels like they didn't quite know what to put in between this exchange and the start of chapter 9, at least in terms of plot. Like, maybe the artifact MacGuffin was supposed to be playing a bigger role in an earlier draft and then it got cut short, but that's just speculation. I do want to take a moment to talk about Paifa's dialogue here, because it's also really good. It doesn't add a whole lot to the plot, because it's mostly just demon lady being spooky, but the purpose it does serve is foreshadowing her betrayal of Ceres. A lot of the lines that she delivers here can be taken to refer either to Ceres or to us. I should at least prepare the meat for slaughter. Not worried, are you? And with the knowledge of the ending of the story, it really gives the impression that she's kind of playing for both sides here, joining the one that she believes will serve her best in the end. It's nice. Anyway, Chapter 8 not having that much to talk about gives me some more time to gush about Chapter 9. <laughs> if you don't care much about Zoja, then this is the other best section of the Soda story. We immediately start strong, at least in the details, giving us a moment of comedic relief after several heavy scenes, which is very important for the pacing if you then want to pull into a triumphant arc, which is what we're doing here. Every line in this section actually tells us a lot about the personalities of the supporting cast, especially those that don't end up getting a lot of screen time, like Sizzle and Dueno. Seriously, most of these would have been better character introductions than their actual character introductions. I long for the days where Isgaran's greatest fear was Dagda's cooking. As much as I'd like to jest. I know. Let's think on the brighter side of things, just for a moment. And then we get the fight that Mabon had really deserved, but Iskaren was given it instead. And, I mean, it's great! We see how the Cryptus, or perhaps maybe Ceres in particular, bring out all the worst parts in somebody. And we get to see all of those facets of Iskaren. Despite acting like a total ass the entire time, Nothing he says comes across as completely unreasonable or unfounded. It really does feel like these are the hidden feelings that he keeps to himself alone at night, cemented in his perspective and his experience as a powerful mortal that has been doing a mostly thankless job for essentially half an eternity. And it's not just Isgaran's dialogue that's well written here. 
it's not a monologue. The first section is the aspect of bitterness and resentment. There's a lot of jealousy in here as well, where he primarily drags Morban post-mortem. And this time, there isn't just pushback from the crew, importantly, it's not coming from the commander, who didn't really know Maban that well, or from Zoja, who's still fighting with herself over living up to her mentor's vision of her. It's from the rest of the cast, the ones that knew him for the longest and that now step in to defend him. The second section is Isgaran's arrogance, his inflated ego, where the writers cleverly reuse key points from Joko's speech all the way back in season 4. Ainat knew what they were doing here, as that speech in particular really did get people to question our place in the world, and some even to side with the fascist lich. It's a very effective speech. And this is the section where the commander themselves talks the most for this chapter, because this one's personal. But after the events of End of Dragons, they're also pretty convinced that they didn't really have another option, so their counters come with a lot more confidence than they could muster in the past. It's a sort of overarching thematic growth, though the whole thing still definitely wounds their pride. And the third is Isgarant's inability to accept change, which honestly has the weakest dialogue out of all of them, as most of it isn't actually about change, but it's their friends appealing to his memory. This makes sense for them trying to talk him out of Ceres' possession, but it has nothing to do with the section itself. Eh, what it lacks in good conversation, it makes up for in gameplay. For each section of the fight, Isgaran uses a different moveset, to mirror that we are in fact fighting each different aspect of him, all of which are still themed after familiar types of magic, so they feel in line with what his abilities as a wizard should be. The first two phases in terms of their moveset, from what I can tell, don't seem to have a significantly deeper meaning, but for the third phase, not only does his model completely stop moving, quite literally becoming rigid, we also don't fight him anymore. We've progressed to fighting the Cryptus, the threats that keep him hesitant to change, in case he makes a mistake that he can't afford. You know, the thing that he's mad at Mabon for in the first section. To finish this section, we literally have to get him to move. Though, I don't really know why the counter to rigidity is unity? It works with the dialogue, and it's hard to put change for the better into one fancy word. And if you really want to stretch the interpretation, you could consider this a callback to all the way in the core story where unity is literally the catalyst for change. But that's being quite generous. But really though, this is the flip side of the introduction to the Wizards Court's operations, where the gameplay really painted them as an incompetent bunch who didn't know the first thing about covert operation. Instead, in this section, the gameplay and the story really perfectly align to create a cohesive, immersive, and memorable whole. And maybe the most impressive part of all of this is that afterwards, you probably don't really hate his Garen. Despite seeing all the worst parts of him, not only has he clearly done some things right, or else there wouldn't be so many people fighting for him, there's also clear moments of vulnerability and pain throughout his dialogue. And after that, we transition into Naios, which I've been spelling wrong the entire time, ahem. In my defense, the filter on Ceres' voice does make it sound like there is an R in there. Ahem. Regardless. There we see Asgarin at his lowest, defeated, broken, and at the edge of giving up, in a scene that very much mirrors how we were introduced to Ceres ourselves. We've been through the same thing, and through that, we are given the chance to understand him in this moment. An excellent introduction to the character proper. Now after this, I don't actually have a whole lot to say on chapter 10, I already brought up earlier that Paphos' betrayal is reasonably well set up, and there's a whole lot of cool lore in the dialogue here, as well as teasing a whole bunch of potential future plot friends. But you know, this is about the writing and not the lore. But you know, I've been so terribly positive this entire time, I can't keep this up, I need to complain about something, and that is going to be Ceres. Because 
He's kind of a bit of a nothing villain. Now don't get me wrong, he's a grade A certified spooky boy. And the voice acting in particular does a fantastic job of making him feel imposing. But he's really not that interesting. He doesn't really play a larger narrative role. Or at least he doesn't play the role that he's supposed to be playing particularly well. And that's partially because he's kind of reduced to being maximum intimidating at all times with the low amount of screen time he actually gets. And that has the side effect of not giving him much room to progress or to develop his motivation or do anything of that sort. He serves that park, he likes seeing people suffer, and that's it. Now, for a demon's personality, that's not unreasonable, but they really could have done a better job of giving him a stronger thematic presence, which is something that demons as a concept excel at. Even Deimos, despite being in the story for exactly one encounter, was pretty good at this. He was as much an actual torture demon as he was a manifestation of all the guilt of Sol's mistakes that he made over the course of his long life. So then what is Ceres? Based on the many similarities between him and Deimos, he's probably a pretty close match there. When we take into account that his favorite target is Asgarin, and that he is partially a foil with parallels to Zoja that I brought up in a previous video, then it stands to reason that he represents the shackles of the past in a similar way to Deimos, but in his case, rather than guilt, he would represent loneliness, isolation, that sort of thing. After all, Isgarin is known for basically trying to do everything by himself, not really communicating with people, and quite literally isolating himself from the entire world. And similarly, Zoja felt very isolated for a long time in between Heart of Forms and now. This just kind of would make the most sense. We also face him in his own personal isolated realm, and there is the fact that we can only defeat him with not one but two allies deciding to trust us. All of this works, but then Soja is straight up not present during this fight, and his Garen, after the initial stages, completely takes a backseat to Pefa, while Ceres mostly talks either to or about us. The commander, who really doesn't have much to do with these themes. It's a weird shift in character focus that ends up making Ceres feel less meaningful as a final boss due to his lack of narrative weight. He becomes little more than a stepping stone on our way to Eparch, which is less than he deserved. Maybe they were also trying to build Eparch up some more here? as being even scarier, but we know so little about him that, in my opinion, that's not all that effective. The focus here is really on Pefa, who is built up as a much, much more interesting character than Ceres, and I think a lot more could have been done with him. So that's the story over. I could cover a few more details from the epilogue, like Soja opening herself up to more connections from her past is Garen showing us more of his composed persona that presumably he maintains most of the time when he's not about to die, and also him being more or less confirmed to be either gender fluid or agender? Unclear on that one, but decidedly not cis. But really, I don't think there's a lot here that I want to cover in detail. So instead, I would for a moment like to leave the analytical space and enter the speculation zone and tell you why Pefa is 100% betraying us. Look, bear with me here. So the end goal here is toppling Eparch, right? And when this happens, it will create a power vacuum, something that Pefa is absolutely smart enough to realize. So no one has even brought up the thought of the end game after defeating Eparch. And I think Pefa is pretty cleverly taking us off that trail by emphasizing not only how much of a big deal Epart is, making it seem like we would be getting ahead of ourselves if we think of what came after, and also emphasizing the role, the role of a shared enemy, at least in the epilogue. But now what would happen after we defeat Epark? 
the Astral Ward isn't going to take over Nios, probably. So, like, clearly she, she wants on the throne, right? But, like, there's no motivation for her to install some other form of government, and she's clearly not displayed any sort of dissatisfaction with the system itself. Just that part. Calling this a betrayal is maybe a bit harsh, but do we really think she's going to be all that much nicer than Eparc if she takes over? I already think she's making dealings with his Garen on that matter when we're not there. And I think she's going to turn into a capital P problem at some point. Now where I think the actual betrayal would come in in a future part of the story is that Pefa is smart enough to know that she will have almost the same weaknesses in her position as Eparc did. She needs a leg up on us so that we don't immediately turn around and fight her next. She's shown us a lot less hubris and a lot more intelligence than Ceres ever did. So why would she not try to take us out when our guard is down, at the moment of our victory over Eparc? I can say, at least so far, she is by far the most interesting of the demon characters, by like, a lot. But there's not a hint of a redemption arc. So it would only make narrative sense to take her character to its logical extreme and give it a full-on heel turn, as a quote-unquote twist laid into the story. I really just can't see a world in which just get rid of Eparg and that's it. Uh, happily ever after. It's just too easy. Okay, enough speculation, let's get to conclusions. During my first playthrough, the impression that the Soto story gave me was that it had a rocky start but ultimately set up future threads quite well, giving me a lot of hope for its continuation. But I couldn't quite nail down what it was that gave me that idea. Now after a replay, I know why. There's two fundamental flaws in the Soto story. One is the pivotal midpoint and the death of Mabon that I already talked about at length in the second video, messing up these two crucial scenes combined with the excessive amount of padding in the form of the mandatory rift hunting really took the wind out of the story sails. And the other one is a much deeper issue that I have with the premise of the expansion. The premise here is that we are uncovering secrets about the world, right? The problem with that is, to be able to find secrets, they need to have existed in the first place. For something to be a secret, you need to tease it, you need to leave hints towards an answer, cryptic enough to get people speculating, but concrete enough to make it feel like there is an actual solution. If you don't do that, then you aren't creating a secret, you aren't creating a mystery. At best, you're making a surprise, at worst, you're making a retcon, and I don't think Soto had a lot of room to actually do this setup that was required to make this idea work. Take the Wizard's Tower. I believe the Wizard's Tower never was meant to have an answer. It was created all the way back in Guild Wars 1 as a curious landmark, with ties to an even more obscure area in pre-searing Ascalon, and its proximity to the mysterious Temple of Ages, yeah, it was ideal to get people speculating. 250 years later in Guild Wars 2, we see its impact on the surrounding land, how a community formed around it, just enough information to get our interest once again. But that's as little information as they could get away with. And that was really always its purpose, just to get people speculating. I don't think they ever had planned for it to actually pay off. So when the idea behind Soto forced them to come up with a solution, it also incidentally destroyed the main thing that made it so interesting, its mysterious nature. The tower, at least in my opinion, was simply more interesting before it turned into a Greek-style Disney castle complete with minigames, vendors, and attractions. And the need to create answers where there are none has ripple effects for the rest of the world building. When we explore areas in Guild Wars 2, that we've already seen in the first game, then they have the original versions of those locations to work off of and 250 years worth of in-universe lore to draw and create logical progressions 
from to flesh these places out. On the other hand, when they create places that we've never visited before, then they have the total freedom to come up with just about anything, as long as it doesn't conflict with the established lore of other places that we have seen. They also made this process easier for themselves by having all of the continents go into isolation for various reasons after the end of Guild Wars 1, meaning they didn't have to think too hard about how cultural exchange would naturally take effect and what that would mean for these places. With Soto, they've managed to create a situation for themselves in which they needed to create a place that was both wholly original, but also needed to feel like it connected to every corner of the world in some capacity, something they've never had to do on this scale. And I don't think they succeeded. At least to me, so much of the new information doesn't feel like we're actually digging up obscure secrets, but rather just a jumble of retcons. Things that feel like they were just made up in that moment, like we're kids playing make-believe and somebody just decides to change the rules so that they can keep winning. And then pretending those were in place all wrong, it just never came up until now. Just instead of a playground fight scene, it's the battle of audience engagement. Some little ideas and lore elements work well, particularly the demons feel well executed and brought into the world, but they work because they had set up beforehand. I was already wondering for a while what the deal was with Deimos and other creatures like the Flesh Weavers. Learning more about them is satisfying. I've never sat here wondering, hey, what if there was a bunch of super powerful wizards acting like the Avengers in the Mists? Wouldn't that be crazy? Because there was no basis for that. And the basis that you could, at a stretch, consider to be there for such a storyline, the Miss Stranger and Raza, things that have been long-running parts of speculation around Life in the Mists, are simply things that aren't really used, at least not in the core story. Maybe there's a lore book I missed, but I don't think that really counts for much. At the same time, the Wizard's Court in its operation comes across as being simultaneously completely incompetent, with their complete lack of ability to actually keep themselves hidden. Don't be suspicious, 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 don't be suspicious. And unrealistically hyper competent with them not being slowed down at all in losing a leadership figure like Mabon. It doesn't feel like a cohesive, believable, and crucially immersive organization. It really does feel like they are here because they were explicitly created for the storyline, not because they are a natural part of the world's history. But once we're done with that section of the story, all the setup and all the introductions amongst the Wizard's Court, then the story can finally return to form, hitting its stride in the writer's comfort zones. Troubled adventurers struggling to find a way to protect their friends and the world from threats much bigger than themselves. That's really what they're best at writing, because that's what they have the most experience writing. And all of that experience really does shine through in how excellent Act 3 can be at times. And that's why I'd call Soto a promising story with a rocky start. That's still my verdict. And that's it. Thank you for watching, especially if you sat through all three of these parts. The whole thing was one big experiment, and while I personally really like talking about story and particularly complaining about things, I don't think I'm gonna be making another one of these anytime soon, because um, these take like upwards of eight hours to make, and that is not only exhausting, there's also almost no support for them, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm probably taking a bit of a break from recording, at least until the next balance patch goes live, and then I'll go back to form talking about those balance patch notes. I decided to not talk about the preview patch notes because the reaction format I don't think was very helpful, but on the other hand, doing a full review of those patch notes in depth when they're not really finished I don't think is particularly helpful either, so I'm just I'm just waiting for the real patch to happen. 
Uh, yeah, so that's that channel stuff. So perhaps some people will come back for that. Until then, goodbye.